Hello and welcome to Senior Solutions, where we bring you topics affecting seniors and their loved ones. I'm your host, Mindy Fellenton, and I'm joined today by Dr. Jen Wolf. She is a senior care pharmacist, and she's going to be talking with us today about the importance of monitoring medications and looking at maybe being over-medicated or maybe there are medicines that shouldn't be taken with certain kinds of foods and things like that. And I'm very excited to have you here today, Dr. Jen, because I have an aging mom and I certainly know a lot of people who I see their little pill boxes and you start to wonder. So can you share with us and welcome Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you share with our audience a little bit about your background and how you came to kind of specialize or focus on senior care pharmacy? Sure. Um, I, For about 10 years, I worked sort of on the retail community side of pharmacy um, where I, I saw a lot of patients, um, a lot of older patients that would come through just getting an absorbent amount of medication and asking a lot of questions and you know, having one doctor here, one doctor there prescribing multiple things and they're not coordinating with each other. So I was sort of the center of, of everything pretty much. I was the only one who knew exactly what they were taking, the only healthcare professional in their lives. So. I had um, always, that just kind of became a passion of mine and a lot of, most senior care pharmacists work in the long-term care facilities. And you know, that's sort of like, for lack of a better term, more towards the end. What about prevention? Like what can we do to prevent these medication problems that lead to hospital visits and a change, drastic change in our quality of life from happening? So that's how I got started. Can you give field. some examples and people who you have helped who have either been diagnosed or not diagnosed, but prescribed medications from various different sources that could have been problematic for them and how you intervened? Absolutely. Um, there, I have definitely seen, um, I have, I make um, home. I do home visits. I see all my patients in their home, and I had a, a patient who had had a stroke and a heart attack within several months of uh, of each other in 2016. And he had, at the time I started working with him, he had seen five cardiologists. He had one say to him that you know, you've only got five minutes with, I've only got five minutes. And so what had happened over the course of seeing, being discharged from the hospital and seeing subsequent, subsequent physicians, he was on blood pressure medications that were really not appropriate. And so he was getting really tired during the day and um, just he also had diabetes so a lot of those medicines can sort of mask the signs of diabetes so that was one you know really th thing that was really important because he was having to take a nap during the middle of the day so this was definitely a change that needed to occur especially since it would help, help prevent future heart attacks and strokes from happening and he was not on a good regimen for that and so had you not stepped in and reviewed the medication, it, it sounds like it right. really could have it, been. It, yeah, not only is his daily, you know, life impacted, but yes, he could have easily had another stroke. Statistically, can you give me a sense of what the average number of medications that someone, say, 65 and older is taking? It's it, about, yeah, it's about 14 per year which which is a lot and um someone in their 80s may be on as many as 18 medications and at one time at one time and Ugh. how this happens is it's called a prescribing cascade and so 
this, these occur when a side effect of a medication is misdiagnosed as an additional, as a, an additional medical condition. So, for example, um, if somebody says, like, say somebody started, uh, like, Wellbutrin, there's a, for uh, depression and anxiety, there's a big uh, side effect of insomnia that a lot of people experience. And in a, in a population that already has issues with sleep, you really want to kind of take that medication in the morning. But a lot of times it just says on the bottle, take one a day. And say you were taking it in the evening and you go to the doctor and you complain of, you know, hey, I can't sleep. So then the doctor says, well, let's give you a sleeping pill then. You know, mm -hmm. I would see this all the time when I, you know, worked in a pharmacy. And so now when you go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and you get up, you're more likely to fall, you know, uh, you know possibly break a bone, you know, all because the medication itself wasn't looked at and you could have just been taking it earlier in the day and avoided all that. So that's an example I like to give. So do you, when you are meeting with these individuals, like in their homes or whatever setting it is, then do you also act as their advocate to help them to have the conversation with their treating physicians as far as looking at the medications? Yes. So I really want to empower patients to be an advocate for their own health because nobody is going to care more about your health than you are. So it's, Im it's important that if, some if something doesn't feel right, it's probably not right. You know, trust your gut. Um, in, health in the healthcare world today, um, doctors are having to see more patients in order to make up for some of the lost compensation um, with Medicare. But uh, so th they're booked. They're booked. They've got to see a lot of patients through no fault of their own. And they just don't have the time that they used to to, to spend with, with patients anymore. So um, one of the things that I encourage patients to do, and I, I have a, a template that I give to them, and I can also um, get it from my website, is I call it a, a pre-appointment um, questionnaire. And so there's a place where you can fill out, you know, the questions that you have for the doctor, um, things that are bothering you, things that you want to talk about. And then so when you get there, if you get it to the doctor ahead of time, then you ha I have like another template where they, I just give to them and they just can write the answers to the questions so they can help streamline the conversation and not get you know, bogged down in, um, you know, what the doctor is telling them. And they, re they remember, hey, I need to speak up. If, the, if, if something's bothering you, I'm telling you, you know, make sure you follow through on that because it, it, mistakes happen. Mm -hmm. Now, do you also, though, if, if requested by your, your patient, do, would you or do you accompany them in any of these doc at the doctor's visits, or is that something you you don't get involved at that level? Um, that's not something that I do. Um, I mean, if they requested it, absolutely, but mm -hmm. that's not something I normally do. But I do, if for instance, if I have a client that's hospitalized. Um, there is, it's such a dangerous transition to go um, from hospital to home or hospital to rehab to home. Or even if you're just being admitted, um, there's a term called medication or reconciliation that needs to occur. So the hospital needs to know like what medications you're already on so that something, so that they know what to be giving you during your stay as well. If, especially if you're going to be there for a couple days. Um, and then so I definitely visit them in the hospital. And then when, they, when you get discharged, to make sure that things happen on the other end, um, 
because there's just not any communication that's occurring between the doctor you see in the hospital and your doctor at home. And so I help in that situation make sure that you're getting the medications that you need to be getting and that there are no interactions. Um, when I was working in a pharmacy, I would see patients that they would bring me a list of 14 medications they'd be discharged on and half of them they might already be on but just a different uh, a different drug in that class. So maybe they take Crestor but it's not on the hospital's formulary so they give them uh, Simvastatin which is Zocor because it's much cheaper and so it's very important like I, I would see that happen so often that you really had to go through their pro profile with a, a fine tooth comb to make sure that they know which ones to take and which ones not to take because the pharmacist does, you know, that's just giving prescriptions out doesn't know um, which one they should be taking. So there could, it sounds like from what you're describing, there could be a duplication. Exactly. Just a, a different name. Exactly, exactly. Duplicate um, medications, um, and potential drug interactions with, with what they're already on. So I make sure that that doesn't happen when they, they either get to rehab or they get home. Yeah, well, that, that sounds like a critical piece to make that connection between the home, the hospital, the hospital, the nursing home, the nursing home, and then home. Ex exactly. So there's all those different segments and pieces of that puzzle. Exactly, and, and just human error, if, especially if you're going to a, a long-term long care rehab or a short-term stay, it, you know, just somebody forgets and the drug just gets left off the list and you don't receive it. It, in, it does not intentional, it just, it's just human error. So. so, Well, speaking of human error, is there not some more formal formalization, I don't know if that's a word, I just if it isn't, I just created it, <laughs> of that listing of medications. In other words, there's some with the electronic uh, medical, medical records. records. Is there not some way of having that more uniform? No. <laughs> there's not because each each hospital, each doctor's office, uses a different software system. And common sense would make you, would make you think that there is one place where all your medications, something that has a list of all your medications, and there isn't unless you've been using the same pharmacy for a long time, you can ask for a printout of your medication history but then there's privacy laws in order to obtain that list. It's, that's kind of the only way, or your insurance company might have a comprehensive list, but there's, there's, no, there's nothing. There's nothing out there. Which is pretty sad. Yeah. I mean, and in a, in a minute, we're gonna take a short break, and I, I think what I'd like to do is when we come back from the break, I, I'd, I'd like to explore that a little bit more because I, I just find it interesting, for lack of a better word, that there isn't that and how that would, would that not be a, a wonderful thing to avoid the types of situations that you're talking about. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to take a short break and when we come back, we'll follow up with Dr. Jen. <coughs> hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning. Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you get stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. Please, don't quit on me. Okay. But remember, it's not what you say. It's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Welcome back to Senior Solutions, where we bring you topics affecting seniors and their loved ones. And I'm your host, Mindy Fellington. And I'm joined again today by Dr. Jen Wolf, who is a senior care pharmacist. And we, before the break, we're talking about some unification or stabilization, I guess, of the healthcare system and 
was was that part of the intent? Do you know initially when the electronic medical records was implemented that there would be a way for people to have a, a place where all of their records would be accessible to all of their levels of doctors and specialists? Um, that's a good question. I think that that was probably part of the intent, but also you have these patient charts that, you know, from years and years of practice can be about this big. And I think it helps the physicians be able to go back and look through a patient's medical history or medications that they've been, you know, that they've had before uh, a lot quicker than if they were just paper charts again. And um, I definitely, you know, if doctor has access to that, they can, they're not in the office, they can look up a patient real quick and provide, uh, be able, if they get a, a call in the middle of the night, you know, be able to help that patient because they've got their profile in front of them um, much easier than they, than they would have. So, well, which brings to my mind HIPAA and how HIPAA would, I guess, kind of weave into that. It, would HIPAA affect the ability to implement that kind of a plan, or is that something that would not be affected by HIPAA to have a system that would lay uh, out everything? Oh, um, I that that's also a good question. I think HIPAA would probably have to be involved, but then again, each person that works on something like that only gets to know as much as that they need in order to do their job. So I, I, that is a great question that <laughs> I, I would like to know more of the answer to, you know, why, why isn't there, you know, this, this database. I think that the state of Maryland is working on something called, um, I believe it's called CRISP. Don't quote me on that. Okay, I won't. But it, um, it's still, you have to, would have to have so many doctors to participate in it and use the system. And what are the financial implications? I have no idea. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Okay. Curious minds. <laughs> <laughs> so could you share with us a little bit about what, aging had what what that plays in the the role of medication and issues relative to medication yeah, sure so as we get older our so the body gets rid of medications through your liver and kidneys and as we get older our liver and kidney function decline just naturally and that means that you have more drug in your body and it's more likely to suffer the side effects of these medications or they, they will intensify as opposed to somebody who's, you know, in their 30s, they'd be much more intense. And so seniors need to have a lower dose of medication. So, um, you know, I've seen and when I was in community pharmacy, this happened, especially with antibiotics, you know, just some physicians just forget to, to give a lower dose. So that is really important, um, a really important point there. Mm -hmm. um, oh, go ahead. Well, I, it prompted me when you were talking about liver and kidney function, just relative to someone who I know who it's kind of based on what you're saying with the kidney that she has one kidney, for example, and she needs to take Coumadin. So it was recommended oh, wow. that she take Eliquis, but then there was a part of that that maybe she can't because of the kidney function, right. kind of what you're saying. Exactly. And so, so there's interplay there. Yeah, so... That's a, a whole nother issue, having one kidney in itself. So you definitely, if it's a medication that is metabolized mostly by the kidneys, definitely need a dose reduction there. Um, all, you know, other, other changes that happen are we don't have as much body fat. 
Um, Yay. And, <laughs> and There's so, a bright part to that. <laughs> so some drugs, that their whole uh, bioavailability is dependent on the, uh, the amount of fat in your body. And um, so when that changes, you can also have higher levels of those medications in the body too. Uh, and another thing that I think is important to mention is there are various th symptoms that we associate with getting older that can be medication side effects. Um, like for example, uh, yeah, for example, trouble with vision. It's not necessarily a decline. It could be a medication. Really? Uh huh. For, can you? share what that might be or an example of what a medication that could affect one's vision would be um if if you have it might be a blood pressure if you're dehydrated for example something that might make you a, a, a little dizzy um there's also ga uh, gabapentin i commonly see prescribed for like for nerve pain for diabetes and things and one of the side effects with that is Clearly, it's clearly like a change <laughs> no pun intended. No pun intended. A change in in vision. Um, also, some medi um, central nervous system medications, like for anxiety, or um, even I want to talk about Benadryl too. Can their symptoms can mimic those of delirium and dementia? Hmm. Um, I have not run across a patient myself who has, this has happened to where they took away the medication and they were themselves again, but I've, I've heard from other people I've met that, that told me, hey, my dad, you know, we thought he was getting dementia and then we found out he was taking on this medication, he stopped it and he was back to his old self. So I occasionally I'll run across that. And there was an article in the Post a couple of months ago, in the Washington Post, where a, the title was, I almost killed my mother with, with uh, Benadryl because her, uh, the lady's mom had, uh, I can't remember if she had some early signs of dementia, mm -hmm. but the Benadryl really caused her to hallucinate and she took her to the emergency room when she tried to flush her underwear down the toilet. So when, the doctor saw her in, in the emergency room and say, don't you know you're not supposed to give her Benadryl? And, you know, why, why would she think anything else? It's right. over the counter. Right. Um, it's been around for a long time. And so that was, you know, an, an excellent piece that she wrote. I think it's very helpful because I run into a lot of, of patients who will take Benadryl for sleep yeah. or for allergies and are just so, so groggy and it changes their muscle status. So Interesting. So it, it, be careful. And it, so that being said, needless to say, it's not just prescribed medications. It's it's all of the over the counter medications, many of which used to be uh, prescriptions. Exactly. And Benadryl in particular, like there's a lot of seniors take uh, Advil PM, Tylenol PM. And also a newer drug, z that is a, it's advertised just for sleep, they all contain Benadryl. It's just sort of masked under this other sort of marketing. And so you have to really look at the ingredients in the medication that you're taking. And diphenhydramine is what's in Benadryl that makes it so dangerous. So definitely be aware of that ingredient. What is it again? Diphenhydramine. So I can. That, that. <laughs> <laughs> D-I-P-H-E-N. Putting me on the spot here. Well, I don't mean to. Okay, I don't, yeah. It's a long word. Okay. But you can always, if you're at a grocery store or in a pharmacy, then ask the pharmacist. And if you see that, that could be problematic. Right, exactly. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. I mean, I, I did not realize that the, the Advil PM and the Tylenol PM contained that either. So, oh exactly. boy. Yeah. We really need someone like you to, to advocate and look out for what you're taking and the interactions are just, it's frightening.
Yeah, exactly. So when I um, work with patients, I you know I visit them in their home. It, I I do that for a number of reasons. I like to it, it helps me, you know, see if they're really taking their medicines like they're they, they're supposed to. So they might say, "Oh, I take this every day." Meanwhile, the bottle says they haven't refilled it since January, and mm -hmm. it's September, and I'm disconnect. I, yes, exactly. There's a disconnect there. Um, I can look around for any potential fall hazards as well, and I think that patients in their own, you know, it's more convenient for them, but they're in their own home, and it's a place where they're more comfortable, and I think it helps them be more engaged. And so um, I talk with them about, you know, what is it that's bothering you, um, that's affecting your daily qu quality of life, because they're medication problems, you know, like side effects, drug interactions, things that are too expensive, they don't have to happen. And so I talk about what is going on with them. And a lot of times it is, um, there's a quote that says any symptom in an older uh, individual should be considered a medication side effect until proven otherwise. Hmm. So a lot of times they, they are medication related problems and I, I talk with them thoroughly, get to know them as a person that, and then kind of we, I take a look, I eliminate their medication problems and then also coordinate with their physicians to make sure everybody has a list and to make sure that they know or are, will make the changes that I suggest and they're very, you know, very much like having an extra person, you know, helping them out when they've mm -hmm. got less time with patients. You know, if, you know, I got this far, my pharmacist, you know, told me this, um, there might be an interaction. And so I talk to the doctor for them so that they are not having to tell it to them themselves because there's a lot of, you know, vernacular and other words that you know, a normal person's not going to know. And and perhaps a, there may be some situations where the doctor's thinking, oh, what do, what do they know? You right. Know? It, 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 that's a perfect example, exactly. Unfortunately, so. but there may be some of that as well. Yeah, so I'm their advocate. Is there an organization, a national organization of some sort of people who are senior care pharmacists? Yes, it is called the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. Um, we've only got about 60 in the state of Maryland. It's a smaller organization. There's a special board certification that um, we have to go through, but a lot of them work in a, in a long-term care setting, and so I really want to be the voice of the active, you know, the active senior that's living in the community so that they can stay at home longer and um, maintain right. their independence. So if someone wants to get in touch with you, Dr. Jen, how would they do that? Um, I, there's my website, which is drjenwolf.com. That's wolf with an E, W-O-L-F-E. And um, also by phone number and and email as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It was very informative. And if you have a topic you'd like to see on Senior Solutions, please feel free to email us. And I will see you next time.